Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional ancestral unceded territories of the First Nations and Native American peoples. Here where I am in Vancouver, those peoples are the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish nations. But I know where many of you are, you're on the land of other nations. Always, but especially during this difficult time, let us remember our connection to our sisters and brothers in these nations and pray for the day in which we might be with them in right relationship. Over to you, Harold. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. You know, um, we live in an area where there's lots of uh, Indo-Canadians, including people in the Sikh community. And so learning about Mirabai will, will cast light and, uh, you know, deepen our understanding and appreciation for the Indo-Canadian heritage. Um, she, uh, <clears throat> I think she's almost a household name in India. You know, like the, no one, I even heard that they think there are millions of lines of songs that could be traced to her. But the scholarship around her is, is uh, all over the map. And, you know, India has never been famous for history. <laughs> that is careful records, right? They don't worry so much about it. Uh, China kept much more careful records. Europeans kept records. India seems to have not worried about it. So it's left open for lots of interpretation. But no one doubts that Mirabai had an enormous impact on the, the music and the songs and the lyrics that are still used. Um, you know, another thing I wanna bring up, I, I brought up from the very beginning monistic mysticism, you know, the belief that uh, ultimate reality or God is, is one and we can, uh, we can merge with it, that mysticism or spiritual practice is a process of merging with the divine. Theistic mysticism tends to say, uh, personalize God, and there's always a little bit of a gap between what we can attain and uh, a theistic God. Another way of breaking that down is to call it personal and impersonal. So personal language about the divine is used. You know what I'm coming to believe, though? This is, tells you more about our mind, our human mind, than ultimate reality. Ultimate reality is beyond our words, <laughs> right? So... But some of us prefer personal language, relational language, or emotional language, or devotional language, and some prefer more abstract, conceptual type. What I find fascinating about uh, Mirabai is she was very well educated in a classical sense. That's unusual for a woman to have been e educated classically, meaning she learned all about the Mahabharata, which is uh, you know, all about ancient India, five generations. It's 18 volumes long, the Mahabharata. It's, a, it's an epic full of stories. She also got a classical education in music from her grandfather. So she was very well educated. So she lived in the early 1500s in India and women at that time usually didn't get this classical education. So this is a significant part. So in a sense, she knew a lot about the literature, the philosophy, um, the religion, the devotional uh, aspects, and music. Music is really important to Indo-Canadians. I, I think you've probably noticed that because we live in that part of the world. They have something called bhajans, which are, it means essentially religious songs, rel spiritual music. Uh, so she was an expert in all of that and an excellent writer. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go down a few points on that first page. The second page sort of uh, introduces a few Hindu concepts. I'm not going to look at much of the second page, but maybe I should start with the second page. I I'm going to just mention a few things that are on that second page. Um, okay. Ultimate reality or Brahman Atman in, in Hindu tradition you can think of that in a very abstract way. It means the beyond, or you can think of it uh, as having three gods, Brahma, Krishna, uh, excuse me, Va Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. You may have heard of these. It's almost like a trinity. Brahma mm -hmm. is the creator. Vishnu is the sustainer or the nurturer. I like that name better. It's the part of God that actually take, comes down and helps humanity at intervals 
through what they call avatars. Rama was an avatar in Hindu belief. So was Krishna. So was Buddha. Okay. And um, now Krishna is really important because he's been the most uh, worshipped avatar in all of Indian history. And if you read the Bhagavad Gita or you've heard of the Bhagavad Gita, that's Krishna doing the talking, the historical Krishna. And so on one hand, he's a human being. On the other hand, he has divine capacity. And uh, he waxes eloquent uh, from time to time. And we're going to look at some of that language. Okay. Another thing I want to show you is this concept of Lila. It's halfway down in the second page, an aspect of the creative world, L-I-L-A. And it means that a reality or nature is something like a play. It's like a drama. It's a clashing of forces. And this is a, a, a key insight into the Indo-Canadian personality, you might say, that, that nature is like a drama or a play, right? So God plays, God is creative, God uh, evolves things. Um, so there's an enormous emphasis on color and music and drama in, in Indo-Canadian culture. And it has a lot to do with this concept of Lila. In other words, we, when we're creative, we're mirroring the creativity of the universe. God has this quality of being creative and dramatic. Okay, so Lila is an important idea. Cass, unfortunately, casts are really important in terms of understanding the society of uh, Indian heritage. So I list the five castes there, Brahmins at the top, Kshatriyas or the rulers or administrators and soldiers, the Vaishyas are the producers, farmers and artisans, Shudras, manual laborers and servants, and then Pariahs or outcasts are people that have broken some of the caste rules. Here's a really big thing to like pay attention to with Mirabai. She lived at uh, early 1500s, for the la for a hundred years before her, there started to be a lot of restlessness in India. Like there was a, a egalitarian movements were popping up all over the place. In other words, people were saying, "Why do I have to? Uh, why do I depend on Brahmin priests for my religion?" You know, this is almost like Protestantism, right? Like in the West, like we people started to say, "I want to read the Bible for myself." I don't want to be told what it means by priests. So in India, starting around 1400, this really started to escalate. We want to be religious in our own way. We don't want to have to decide who do we eat with, who do we marry. We want men and women to be free to hang out with each other and, and, and you know, in devotional settings. So this was starting to go on. And she is a very strong uh, expression of, of all of this, right? She she was a revolutionary and an egalitarian. Okay. Um, one other thing, the four yogas, I list the four kinds of yogas, classical, and this is the knowledge yoga, love and devotion yoga, work and service yoga, and raja yoga, which means the systematic integration of all of those plus a few other things. When you and I hear the word yoga, you know, in, in North America, where usually the people mean Raja Yoga, they mean a whole sophisticated set of exercises. But in India, you know, Gandhi, for example, was a karma yogi, meaning he emphasized work and service and justice building. You know, our own Kathy here is, is like a karma yogi. <laughs> I mean, she may be other kinds of yogi too, but she's concerned about service a lot. So that's, that's one type of devotion. That's one type of uh, yoga. Okay, bhakti yoga is devotional yoga, meaning you're, you're, you're worshiping God through um, a, a, an avatar, an embodiment, or a shrine, or an idol. They're not afraid to use the word idol, you know, in, in Indo-Canadian context. Um, like they say, for example, a, a statue of Krishna is not Krishna, but it reminds you of Krishna, right? It brings you closer to Krishna. So anyway, um, that issue was not as intense in India as it was in uh, the West, in our religious heritage here. 
So bhakti yoga is the type of yoga that Mirabai was very steeped in, devotional yoga. In fact, she even thought of herself as married to Krishna. And I want to show you, you've seen this kind of a picture. I'm showing you Krishna. You see he has blue skin. So he's depicted as having blue skin. You know, I was actually in India and I found people that are, were so dark, their, their skin almost looked blue. I couldn't believe it. I was down there in Bangalore, you know, Southern uh, India. And so I, I kind of understand what they're saying here. So they're saying Krishna historically was very dark. In fact, the name Krishna means the dark, mysterious attractor. What a powerful name for an avatar, the dark, mysterious track, attractor. Okay. Um, all right. That's enough for page two. Go back to page one. I, I'm just going to introduce some things about this lady, uh, Mirabai. Um, you see her dates, 1498 to 1546. We call her an egalitarian devotee and poetess of divine love. Um, and, and she would be more well known than a lot of the other figures we're looking at. Uh, if you're talking to people from with an Indo-Canadian background, they, they will probably know about Mirabai or her music. Okay, um, she's considered a saint. She was never formally made a saint. So that's uh, like, it's because of the reverence people have for her. You know, recently I found out there were conferences devoted to Mirabai. You know, like only like 10 years ago, she's coming into her own um, because of the interest in women's equality, um, because of uh, the interest in breaking down the caste system, you know, or the class system in different parts of the world. You know, Gandhi thought of Mirabai as, um, how did he put it? She was a perfect example of, of nonviolent resistance. Right. She solved problems that were very difficult without using any kind of violence. Okay. Um, all right. And almost everything we're saying about, about Mirabai, you know, could be contested if you're, you know, a fussy scholar. But I'm sort of giving you the big picture, the overall sense of her and her writing. Okay. Um, she lost her mother at an early age, her grandfather, a devout worshiper of Vishnu, the sustainer, the nurturing part of God, uh, brought her up, offering her a classical education, including rigorous training in music. She was a, a major contributor to what's called the Sant tradition, S-A-N-T. It means saint, but it also means egalitarianism. So for a hundred years before Mirabai, it, it, this movement was really starting to gain steam. And in fact, the whole Sikh faith is an, is an expression of, of the egalitarian movement in India, or we might even call it Protestantism. They were protesting the way things were. They wanted more immediate access uh, to sources of religious nurture. Okay, she was very deeply religious in her youth. Mirabai, a devotee of Krishna, the most widely worshipped of the avatars. Um, I want to back up on Krishna. You know, I happen to believe he's, a, he's historic. He's not imaginary, right? There was something called the, the Mahabharata, which described five generations. Of course, it's been mythologized and incredible things happen in it. But it, it, to say that none of that happened, you know, it, it is outrageous, I think, right? So, he was a real figure. We don't know when he lived. He might have been 1400 BCE before the common era. It might have been 1100 BCE. But that's the serious range for, for when he lived Krishna as an avatar. Okay. All right. Um, you know, a, a little bit about him more so you can appreciate. He, he played the flute. Have you seen pictures of Krishna playing the flute in the in the in the woods and young gopis which were young milkmaids being attracted see that's significant those milkmaids were poor but they're attracted to an avatar who's high in the caste system right so that again right in the beginning of krishna devotion we have a little bit of this egalitarianism okay um 
she married a guy unwillingly. Get this. This would make a very good movie. And they've made a lot of movies of this. But they're in Punjabi or some other language that we don't know. Um, she carries with her a little statue of Krishna to her wedding. <laughs> in other words, she never gave up her devotion to him. She was married against her will. She said, my real husband is, is Krishna. Oh, my goodness. Makes for a very good story. Mm -hmm. She spent a lot of time at uh, Krishna temples and hanging out with devotees of Krishna, both men and women. See, this is part of the egalitarianism. And they didn't pay any attention to caste differences. This guy, Ramananda, who was one of the main Sant tradition, he, he ate with people of all castes. And so he was punished. And he said, he, so he decided to form a whole new movement where caste is completely ignored. Okay. Um, it says in 1528, the new king, Mirabai's brother-in-law, tried to restrain all her activities. You see, she was outrageous. She was embarrassing the family. You know, when her, her the guy she married against her will died a few years later, and she did not commit uh, sati, which means self-immolation. She's supposed to get on the funeral pyre of her husband, according to caste law. Can you believe this? And she didn't do that. A whole lot of people were starting to not do that. That was part of the egalitarian reform. That rule makes no sense. Okay. Um, and then near the end of her life, she started to go to the cities that were very important to Krishna in his earthly ministry. Vrindavan was one of them, and Dwaraka is another. These are very important cities in India uh, to people who know about bhakti devotion or the worship of Krishna. You've heard of Hare Krishna, right? See, Hare Krishna is a very, you could say, evangelical form of bhakti worship. And it tends to take the Bhagavad Gita very literally. You know, it doesn't look at it figuratively the way uh, most uh, Indo-Canadians would. Okay, um, I'm two thirds of the way down the first page introducing her. At the bottom, it talks about her status. Uh, her sainthood was never formally bestowed, but she became admired by the multitude. So she's simply called a saint. Now, when she, oh, right near the end, I should tell you this, 1546, supposedly, Brahman priests were sent by her marital family to return her to Rajasthan, which is northwestern India, where she was born, and they were threatening to fast to death if she didn't go with them. Now, that, you see, this is very dramatic. That's a lot of social pressure. A whole bunch of priests are saying, we're going to fast to death if you don't come with us. And she, the story says she disappeared, merging into an image, a large statue of Krishna. Okay, that's the story. I'm not saying you have to believe that. That's, that's the story. So she got out of it by stepping out of this life, which she had always wanted to do anyway, because she, she looked at death as a way of getting closer to Krishna. And that's one of the themes of her writing, and, and we're going to look at it. I picked out six themes of her writing uh, that she, and her songs, and that's one of them, that death, in a way, should be welcomed if it gets you closer to your beloved. Wow. Um, you know, I mentioned down here at Padavali, an anthology of dozens of songs and poems, either written or inspired by Mirabai. So no one knows exactly what she wrote. <laughs> they just, there's a sense of a whole lot of songs were influenced by her and have her flavor. They're, and they're well-written. They're beautiful to sing. And, they, and they're also good poetry. Okay. So um, anyway, there is a, a volume like that that shows the whole range of emotions long, uh, having to do with love, all having to do with love, longing, anticipation, ecstatic joy of union, adoration, jealousy, anger, as well as merger with the one who transcends all distinctions. Now, here's where uh, a good source, there's a, a Sikh scholar named Nabadas, who 
wrote something called the Bach Tamal or the Garland of Saints. And he did that in 1605. So that's a solid work where he tells stories about the saints. And th this, is this is part of the story he told about Mirabai. So Kathy, can you read that part that's uh, under Bach Tamal? And it's in, it, I put it in. Um, yes. Modesty in public? Yes, that one, yeah. yeah. Yes. Modesty in public, the chains of family life. Mira shed both for the lifter of mountains. Like a latter day gopi, she showed what love can mean in our devastated age ending age. No inhibitions, totally fearless. Her tongue sang the fame of her tasteful lord. Villains thought it vile. They set out to kill her, but not a single hair on her head was harmed. The poison she was brought turned elixir in her throat. She cringed before none. She beat love's drum. So this is sort of a, a pretty eloquent little description of her. Right in the beginning, it says modesty in public, chains of family life. She ignored that. <laughs> right? She was not concerned with being modest in public, nor was she paying attention to uh, family obligation. Her family was her, her a community of devotees to Krishna. That was her true family. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, that word lifter of mountains, see, that means Krishna. He's the lifter of mountains. That comes from all the stories about Krishna. One time the story says, you know, it was raining and it was raining and it was raining and it was raining and it was flooding. So Krishna lifted up a mountain and blocked the rain. So you could say that's completely mythologized, but see what it means is Krishna was becoming more important than the gods of the rain. That's how I interpret it. See, he, he was taking some of the roles of the deities in his day. Another role, another, uh, they call him also, they have another name for Krishna, the, um, the storm-bodied one. One time there was a drought and it was getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. He became a storm and thereby, you know, replenished the land and the people and the crops. That's a story about Krishna. So, you know, these are these are miracles or mythologies that show how great this figure was. You don't have to take it literally to have respect for these stories. Um, and at the bottom, I point out that there's two kinds of bhakti yoga or, or bhakti devotion. Uh, bhakti means devotion, love yoga. Um, again, you can... You can love a God who's abstract and has no qualities, or you can love a God that's full of qualities, right? So saguna means with qualities, and nirguna means beyond qualities. Now, if you look at her language carefully, it's, it's both of those, right? I, I've got to back up one more thing, uh, background, which she knew. She knew about Shankara, who was the greatest monistic mystic in Indian history, Shankara. He was about 1,200 years ago. And then 300 years later comes Ramanuja, who's the greatest theist thinker in India. Most of, uh, most of Mirabai's thinking seems like Ramanuja to me, but some of it is monistic like Shankara. And so in other words, she absorbed the literary heritage of India and also the theological discourses. She, she absorbed all of that and, and synthesized it, which is actually better, I believe, you know, rather than being strictly on one side of it. Because I think that difference between monism and theism is mostly a, a human difference. It's, it's the way we function and that it has less to do with ultimate reality or the divine, I believe. Okay, so jump to the third page, and um, there's a piece of literature here from the Bhagavad Gita, and I, I took some things from, from over three chapters, where I call these I am statements, so God is saying, here's who I am, and it's a bunch of beautiful images of the divine. Who, who's willing to read? Susan, you willing to read? Okay, unmute. 
And can you read that whole passage on, on page three that says, Krishna offering God's self-revelation in the Bhagavad Gita? Hey, I am the source of all beings. I support them all, but I rest not in them. I bring forth all creation. I am worshipped as one and many. I am the father, the mother, and the creator of all. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end of all things. I am the same to all beings. My love is ever the same. But those who worship me with devotion, they are in me, and I am in them. I am beginningless, unborn, the Lord of all worlds. Among the sons of light, I am Vishnu, the sustainer. Among the northern tribes, I am Krishna, charioteer for the Pandavas. Among words, I am Om, the word of eternity. Among trees, I am the tree of life. Among things that move not, I am the Himalayas. Among men, I am the king of men. Among bodies of knowledge, I am knowledge of the soul. Among the seasons, I am the season of flowers. I am the beauty of all things beautiful. I am the goodness of those who are good. I am the silence of hidden mysteries. Know thou that whatever is beautiful and good, whatever has glory and power, is only a portion of my own radiance. I am all-powerful time, which destroys all things. Those who worship the imperishable, the infinite, the transcendent, unmanifested, they reach in truth my very self. Wow. Wow is right. That's I think quite that, a resume. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Yeah, yeah. This is one a, a very powerful passage in all of the world's scriptures. Chapters 9 to 12 in the Bhagavad Gita, the self-manifestation of God. So it's as if, so like Krishna is just a, you know, he's a charioteer and he says, but I know all about divine reality. And Ar Arjuna, you know, his partner says, well, I want to see, tell me about divine reality. And this is what comes. Oh my goodness, powerful stuff. And in terms of um, imagery, some of it's personal, like to say God is father, mother, creator, those who worship me with devotion, they are in me and I am in them. That's all personal bhakti language. But then at the end, there's things like I'm the imperishable, the infinite, the transcendent, unmanifest. Like I'm the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of the beginning before there was anything that, you know. So there are both uh, monistic abstract things here, as well as concrete devotional language. Wow. So it's quite, quite amazing. It um, sounds similar to like how in, in Christianity, the, the I am the alpha and I'm the omega. Okay. And in in yeah. Islam, the qualities, like so many of these, if you translate it into Arabic, would be the names of God that we talked about. You're absolutely right. That would make a fascinating study to take all of that similar literature in, in the different faith traditions where, where God is sort of saying, here's my qualities. Here are my qualities that you can get glimpses of. You can't fully grasp, but you get glimpses. Okay. Uh, however, I find some of this really instructive. Like, okay, uh, among, king, among men, I am the king of men. Like you sort of say... Among mountains, I'm like the Himalayas. <laughs> In other words, the, the top, the most exalted version of anything you know. Among all things good, I'm the goodness of all those who are good. Capital G, good, goodness. Oh, my goodness. Any other reactions to this? I shared it with you because I want to show you some of the beauty of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the central, it's a, a little piece of the uh, Mahabharata, and it would be something that people like um, Mirabai would have memorized long parts of it. She would have mastered all of these phrases, and she would use them in her writing. Okay, any other comments so far? Okay, Jennifer. Um, would you be willing to read that first theme 
let me introduce these themes. These themes came from this book. You see, this is called Mirabai Ecstatic Poems by Robert Bly and Jane Hirschfield. So those two, a poet and a scholar get together and they look at all the stuff attributed to her and they put them in categories of types of poems, right? And then I went through all those types and come up with six themes just to show you. And I borrowed lines from all over the place. We, this is a weird thing about her, her writing. You can take things from different poems and put them together and they sound good too because they're all around the same theme. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. These are the themes. Uh, receptivity to the divine beloved. Next, next theme, qualities of the divine beloved. Third theme, willingness to sacrifice things of this world for love, for spiritual love. Fourth theme, anguish of separation from the divine love. Where are you, God? In other words, the dark night of the soul experience. And then another theme, joy of reunion with the divine love, beloved after the dark night of the soul. And then death, delight with death as it brings final reunion with Krishna. So those are themes, major themes in her writing. And I just sort of went all through this book and took my favorite lines and stuck them together. And it sounds like this is all one coherent thing. You see, but that's what everyone says about Mirabai. All her lines fit together. She's always talking about love and different aspects of love, right? And so, okay. Um, who, Jennifer, willing to read? Yes. All right. Which, which one did you want me to read? Oh, the one that's called theme, receptivity to the divine beloved at the Great. bottom of the third page. Yeah. Okay. Listen, my friend, this road is the heart opening. If we could reach the Lord through immersion in water, I would have asked to be born a fish in this life. If the worship of stone statues could bring us all the way, I would have adorned a granite mountain years ago. I take the path that ecstatic human beings have taken for centuries. Something has reached out and taken the beams of my eyes. All I was doing was being and the dancing energy came to my house. Oh, friends on this path, my eyes are no longer my eyes. A sweetness has entered through them, has pierced through to my heart. My Lord has entered the play of the world, and the world is amazed. Seeing his beauty, I offered him all that I am. I gave my heart without fear to the beloved. As the polish goes into the gold, I have gone into him. I will praise the dear Lord with my singing and I'll cross the ocean of this world. In my dreams, the great one married me. 4,000 people came to the wedding. All the doorways were made royal. My only consort is Krishna. None else in the whole world, which I have seen through and through. Wow. Yeah. Any reactions to this? You know, I, I have to comment. There's all kinds of stuff. Like, my Lord has entered the play of the world. Remember I told you about Lila? Lila? Sometimes mm -hmm. it's called Lila. The idea that the universe is creative. God made it that way. God is experimenting all over the place. So this is saying, my Lord entered the play of the world. And the world is amazed. Wow. Wow. She says, the great one, that means him. Dancing energy, capital letters, that's him too. You know, remember he was dancing while playing the flute in the forest, 1400 BCE or 1100 wow. BCE. Um, so she's using it. Uh, then she says, if I would have been born a fish, if immersion in water was a holy experience. You know, like in India, you go to the Ganges, right? She's saying, you know, that's not, if that were how I got close to Krishna, I would be a fish. I would try to become a fish. I would be swimming in him. <laughs> yeah. Any reactions to all this? If some of you are musical, 
uh, you can sing these things. So I'm told. I'm not, I'm not musical. I'm only an appreciator. But her mm -hmm. language is simple enough to sing. <laughs> and it's got images that you can hear, right? That, are, that don't cause you to do too much complex reasoning in the middle of the, the poem or the song. Mm -hmm. She reminds me a little bit of Rabia, uh, where Rabia yes. didn't even need to leave her house or go anywhere. Uh, she was just so in love with the divine and the divine was so present for her. And in this, she reminds me of that, of just wanting that total to like, yeah, just immediately abandon life and just fully be with the divine. So it's just remarkable. A way she's very different than Rabia is that she was totally into community. Like her family was were these communities, which were a lot of them, and they moved. They actually moved around. They they sang, you know, they danced. They they had what we would call devotions or worship in the park, or at temples or all over the place. So it's, it's like so she is more sociable, I think, than like high on the extrovert scale almost, except here's a tricky thing. I think this love that they're feeling in the community is always spiritual love. Like, you know, they're not orgies. These are not, <laughs> you know, it's men and women. And, and maybe people suspect that and want to say that so that they can put them down and try to control them, right? From a political point of view. Uh, but that's not what they're up to. The same thing with the Sufis, I think it can be said that they had communities that were so love, any kind of love is like a, a, a pointer to the love. Very, of, yeah. It's very Rumi esque. Rumi, thank you, Rumi. <laughs> I love uh, Kabir too. See, Kabir, Kabir yeah. was right before her. Kabir was an admirer of Ramanuja or Ra Ramananda. And then no one knew whether Kabir was Muslim or Hindu. It didn't seem to matter, right? And see, so that Sant tradition didn't care about those affiliations. They simply want to get closer to God. And they seem to think that if you were poor, you had better access to that almost, almost. See, actually, Mirabai is rich, at least in terms of background. Right? She's a Brahmin. But she doesn't care about that. She completely, uh, you know, ignores that. What matters is love of of the of God, and 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 there are people around you who appreciate that, and can write about that, and can inspire you. Okay, questions, comments, complaints. Um, can you just clarify the um, that science tradition and their relationship, like the Sikhs? Um, we just saw um, um, a Sikh presentation at the, uh, so is that the same time period or is that a different time period? You know, the Sikh faith started in 1499 mm -hmm. to 1539. Those are the 40 years of Guru Nanak's ministry. So look, look, 1499 to 1539, that's exactly the time we're talking about. Okay. You know, and, and this had been building for decades before this. That's what they mean by the Sant tradition, the need for equality, the need for simplifying. Uh, why should we be dependent on Brahmin priests for our spirituality? Um, also, why, why is it that the poor are not getting educated in the poetry of the ages? See that In that way, it's like a social revolution. So, you know, a lot of the people who wrote the Sikh Guru Granth Sahib, the Sikh scriptures, were uh, Hindus. Some of them were, but who cares what they were? They were into this same kind of thing that Mirabai was into, the beloved, close relations with the beloved. They sound like Kabir, they sound like Rumi. That's, that's true. Yeah. Um, oh, wait, Harold, I think Donna has a question. Please, please. Hi, Donna. What is her? I, I this is leaping ahead, but I I I, I I'm wondering how um, how influential she is in Hinduism today. You know, I think the answer is she's very influential, but in popular culture. That's I mean that may be the category people have for her. 
mm-hmm. popular culture, beautiful songs about divine love. But her her focus was on the devotional. That's it right. Does, but it I doesn't, think, yeah. yeah. It doesn't uh, impact that way so much to um, contemporary Hindus. Hindus. That's my impression. She's okay. a saint in the sense that she put up with a lot of oppression and and transcended it in a way. Um, but I don't think she's the center of any devotional, you know, movement. And it was just during her lifetime that she had that kind of influence. That's the way it seems to me. Yeah. She was just a, a, a high profile member of these wandering uh, communities of, of bhakti devotion mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, a very highly educated one. So, you know, she could connect this type of writing with the traditions, you might say. Right. Um, you know, an example of that is where she says here in this one that we just read, I take the path that ecstatic human beings have taken for centuries. Mm-hmm. You see, she's summing up the whole bhakti tradition going way back 3,500 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's saying that's that's been around a long time. The, the, I, the need to be devoted to the divine through intermediaries like Krishna or Rama. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, so, okay. Um, she wouldn't want to. Be, it doesn't sound like she would want to be the subject of anyone's devotion. No. Right. Like that she would be wouldn't want to be opposite of right. Like she's happy to not be that. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Another thing here. She says, "I'll cross the ocean of this world." You see, the ocean is like a metaphor for turbulent existence samsara the the world of of change the world of agony the world of uplift and defeat right so she's sort of she's using all these great metaphors that are that permeate uh hindu literature down through the ages okay um the next one is the qualities of the divine beloved so this has these metaphors I told you about before. The one who lifts the mountains, that's Krishna. The, the storm-bodied one, that's, the, that's Krishna too. The master with a capital M, that's Krishna too. Lord, that's Krishna too. Or the divine beloved. You know, she wouldn't, you didn't find big fights between Rama devotees and Krishna devotees. Like those are two different avatars, but they didn't argue about it. Right. They said they, you like Rama stories. Good. I like Krishna stories I, or some liked them both. Right. So the, it wasn't a, a denominational difference, although for some people it is. There are some people that, that think, you know, uh, uh, in a rigid way about groups. My group is better. My group is more correct. I don't think she thought that way at all. Um, OK. And then she also talks about these women in the forest. Who are they? Those are those gopi milkmaids again. Um, okay, who, who's willing to read? Who hasn't read? Okay, thank you, Joan. Can't, the wild woman of the forest. The wild woman of the forest saw no difference between low and high, wanting only the milk of his presence. Illiterate. She never studied the teachings. A a single turn of the chariot's wheel brought her to knowledge. Now she is bound to the storm-bodied one by gold cords of love and wanders his woods. Servant Mira says, whoever can love like this will be saved. My master lifts all that has fallen. Mira's Lord is the one who lifts mountains. He removes evil from human life, attacks the beginnings of greed, For safety, I go to him. This Lord of mine gives joy to the pure in heart and watches over the poor. He is half lion and half man. I have some light, wanting to mingle it with thy light. If the world does not admire the Lord, it is mad. What is the world's wisdom compared to his? O beloved, it's promised that all who speak thy name will be saved. By the power of thy name, Rocks loosen their hardness. They melt like ice into water. The earth itself grows tender, wanting to yield. I too feel that pull toward thee. 
The ocean of fleetingness sweeps up all beings hard, pulls them into its cold running, fierce, implacable currents. Lord, thy name is the raft, the one safe passage over. Mira says her Lord's beauty cannot be measured. She wants only to live near his feet. The energy that holds up mountains is the energy Mira bows down to. He lives century after century, and the test I set for him, he has passed. Hmm. You know, this uh, technique of naming yourself in your own poetry. See, mm -hmm. Kabir did this. Rumi did this sometimes. It, it, it shows up in Guru Nanak's writings. It, throughout the Sikh scriptures, you'll see some of this. Um, so, okay, th to me, this is all part of the Sant tradition. We don't, in other words, I am an authority too. What you see, oh my good, you see, that's that's very radical. I get to quote myself and describe myself. I'm not a waste of time. Right? He, he, Ravidas was lowest class of all. He was a, a shoemaker, but he's now in the Sikh scriptures, and he was at this time too. Mm. And he was always referring to himself yeah. in the in the writing. You know, so did Guru Nanak. Okay, so you see some of that here. And uh, storm-bodied one. I, you know, I'm really amazed by this set of lines here. By the power of that name, rocks lose their hardness. They melt like ice into water. The earth itself grows tender, wanting to yield. So, you know, like any good poet, she's looking everywhere for, for metaphors for the power of the beloved, what the beloved can do. Harold? Yeah, please. Would you would you just say a bit more about um, the second line there, illiterate, she never studied the teachings. A single turn of the chariot's wheel brought her to knowledge. Okay, she's talking about these gopis, the wild woman of the forest. She, she, she's using them mm -hmm. as, as a metaphor. Uh, saw no difference between low and high, okay wanting only the milk of his presence. Those gopis didn't say, oh, I have no business uh, loving Krishna because he's a Brahmin. They were just so attracted. So, okay, illiterate. What about, what about the single turn of the chariot's wheel? Ah, oh, that's another metaphor that permeates uh, uh, Hindu literature. The, the turning of the wheel is a new dharma. That's a metaphor for a, a new law. So a, an avatar can start a whole new law going. See, they believe Buddha did this too. He turned the wheel. He, he, he gave humanity a new dharma, a new, a new wheel or a new law, a new path. All of that sort of, uh, okay. Yeah, you're, you're picking things out, you see, because that's why it kind of helps to know a little bit about the background. Yeah. Some of yeah. the, the imagery is from yeah. Hindu. It, it shows how well educated she was. You know, mm. she had really been steeped in all this stuff. Thank you. Other observations? <clears throat> oh, half lion, half man. You see, this is their way of talking about uh, these avatars are half divine and half human. This is what people said about Jesus. Some, even some early Muslims tried to deify Muhammad. He didn't let it happen, All right? But so that's a tendency. When you come across an avatar, you, you say, are they man or God, right? Or, you know, you're confused. And the answer is, they're a little of both. They're an intermediary between higher levels and ordinary human reality. Um, you know, like in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna shows Arjuna, uh, images of God and it overwhelms him and then at the end he says okay I'm back now I'm the charioteer you can relax I'm just a human being beside you you know figuring out what are we going to do in this Mahabharata war are there any, any other reactions here I have a question about the line right after that I have some light wanting to mingle it with thy light um, is it like uh, your own kind of personal holiness uh, and then to like merge into the divine or how do you, is there more of a story? So that light thing, to me, this is talking about 
uh, Atman with a capital A is the universal soul, the light built packed into the whole universe. And then, but but then there's Atman with a small a, that's just the soul. So in other words, we have a little bit of light, <laughs> and then there's this big light out there permeating everything, and mm -hmm. especially in in the the avatar. There's a whole lot of light in, in that one being. Um, so, okay, where is this? I have some light wanting to mingle it with thy light. Another metaphor. My, You know, they have drops going into the ocean. You have little sparks of light going into a big fire. Um, may, just, it's a poetic way of talking about uh, spiritual growth that's love with a capital L, you know, at least I see it that way. Okay, uh, you know, the next one, it gets a little sociological, willingness to sacrifice the things of this world, meaning society and benefits that come from your class. I, I think Jen has a question first. Oh, please. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I just, I wanted just to say something in it. It doesn't quite fit, but um, I don't know if you know the, I'm sure you all do, the writer Maribai Starr, who writes, mm -hmm. she does all sorts of um, beautiful interreligious literature, and she writes about Christian mystics and, um, I mean, uh, mystics Star. of all faiths. Wow. Yeah. Do you know Mirabai Starr? You know, I've heard that name and never dug mm -hmm. it up. That's interesting. Oh, you huh? would you would find her fascinating. She writes oh. and she is she actually considers herself interreligious. She doesn't consider herself right. one religion or the other. Right. And um, she would fit so well into this group. And I've heard her speak uh, and in person one time and she writes poetry. But listening to all of this poetry by this Mirabai, I understand. I imagine she picked her name. I don't think she, she was born that with that name. name. She was probably <laughs> yeah, not born but, with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I can see why I can see and she uses a lot of this language in her own poetry, but I can see why mm -hmm. this mystic is someone who was appealed to her. And yeah, so, you know, even the metaphor of the raft is here right near the end. Kathy, you make me think of this because the raft is considered a Buddhist metaphor. But you, you remember Hinduism uh, reabsorbed a lot of Buddhism. Right, it's it's very it's so different than the, what happens in the West. So, uh, the, in other words, that raft imagery doesn't belong only to Buddhism. <laughs> Anybody who wants wisdom can use it. Right? That that's how she's thinking. Um, however, that might bother a Buddhist. Like a Buddhist might say, "Wait a second, you're taking my wisdom that comes from Buddha. You can't do that." You know. <laughs> so. Harold, you'll definitely want to check out Mirabai Stars, her latest book, which I think came out a couple of years ago, is called Wild Mercy. And it's about it, it takes it takes um, teachings and words from women mystics. It's about women mystics. Really? Yeah. Oh. It's called Wild Mercy. It's beautifully written. I mean, everything she writes is beautiful, but I love this book. She's contemporary. She's right oh, now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she has a website totally right now. Yeah, Wild yes. Mercy is what it's you called. Star with two R's? Yes. Mirabai Star with two R's. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. We all have something to look up now. <laughs> a new friend, you know. Okay, um, Kathy, can you read number, th well, bottom of page four, willingness to sacrifice things of this world. Yes. My family says, don't ever see him again but my eyes have their own life. They laugh at rules and know whose they are. I can bear on my shoulders whatever you want to say of me. Mira says, without the energy that lifts mountains, how am I to live? I went to the market and bought the dark one. You say I gave too much, I say too little. What I paid was my social body, my town body, my family body, and all my inherited jewels. The teacher has whispered into my ears, and familiar ties have gone the way of weak thread. Mira says, the dark one is my husband now. I forgot about the world and its duties. 
I have felt the swaying of the elephant's shoulders. And now you want me to climb on a jackass? My family's honor, my reputation, it's all water running through the fingers. I've given my body and soul to the saints of divine love. I hold on to the lotuses of their feet. The Lord has saved Mira. He knows well that she is his servant. What do I care for the words of the world? The name of the dark one has entered my heart. Very potent stuff. Now that I've taken a ride on an elephant, I certainly don't want to ride a jackass. <laughs> she's sort of, oh, oh my God. And then, you know, she's talking, I think she's talking about buying that, that little idol or image of Krishna in the, in the store. Where does she say that? I went to the market and bought the dark one. You say I gave too much, I say too little. It was priceless, in other words. Wow. What I paid was my social body, my town body, my family body, and all my inherited jewels. Those are worthless compared to divine love. My goodness. You know, it says down there near the bottom, uh, saints of the divine... Saints, I have given my body and soul to, to the saints of divine love. So that's the community, the bhakti community, and the many versions of that, the different bhakti communities that you would find all over northern India. Um, you know, another thing I haven't even mentioned yet, they, you see, the priests were using Sanskrit, is, which is an ancient language. It's sort of like uh, Roman Catholic priests using Latin as a way saying, I know Latin and you don't, only the church knows Latin, Latin is the holy language. I'll tell you what it means if you really want to know. So they didn't buy this Sanskrit stuff, like they're going to do their religion in whatever language is around, whatever language people are using, you know, Gujarati, Rajasthani, the, the vernacular, so to speak, ordinary language. And that was part of the Sikh faith too. The heck was Sanskrit. That, in other words, that's sort of implicated in a colonial, like a hierarchical system. Um, okay, any other reactions to? Okay, there's only three more of these. And uh, you could probably do the same thing I did, find them yourself. Like you, you, you can put them in, all her lines fit with all her other lines when they're in a certain theme. That's what I have found out. My, that's, that's an amazing quality. Um, okay, so Linda, you haven't read yet. Okay. <clears throat> Can you read Angu where it says, uh, where are Anguish. we? Anguish. Anguish of separation. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, oh friend, I sit alone while the world sleeps. In the palace that held love's pleasure, the abandoned one sits. Deep is my agony in this night of separation. When will the streaks of golden dawn appear? The moonlight is no comfort to me. If I sleep, I awake as if startled by a dream. O oh, merciful one, deprived of thee, I lie in anguish. Bless me then with a vision of thee. My teacher shot an arrow. It passed all the way through. Now its absence burns in my heart, in my restless body. With the water of my tears, I have raised up the vine of divine love. You know, this theme is all over mystical literature of, you know, there's no doubt about these figures believing in divine reality of some kind, right? But sometimes they, even they, are separated from it. You know, like next week or next session is on Teresa of Avila. She's going to use the image of water and thirst you can get thirsty even though you're surrounded by water. You don't have access to it. And Teresa of Avila worked with St. John of the Cross who wrote a book called The Dark Night of the Soul. Now that be, that's become the, you could say, the, uh, the label, right? Or the theme of a, of, of a major part of, of mystical writing. It's almost like a test. And in fact, a lot of them say that this is like a test. Otherwise, you'd be too continuously happy and you wouldn't learn anything new. 
if you didn't get feel separated from time to time from your beloved. So mm -hmm. this is what she's describing here. This is this is a major theme, not a not a minor one. Right. So there's a lot of agony in some of, of her uh, writing, you know, the pain of separation. I wonder what she's what she says is the sort of what what is this what is the source or the cause or the impetus of that separation because clear, cl clearly she wouldn't think that it was god that left her you know or krishna left her right right so well, you know i'm curious what you know what she would have felt. here's a guess here's a guess that she's this would be the theistic part of, of mirabai that she is not identical to the beloved she wants to get close to the beloved but she's not identical and she's finite and the beloved is infinite so it's her problem if she's separated not his she's not blaming him too much i mean she's describing this is what happens to a finite being who loves mm -hmm. they they can feel you might not even be rejected by by your beloved and you feel that way right mm -hmm. what business have you to feel that way well you may mm -hmm. so anyway this is uh, how i think she might respond uh, mm -hmm. to this kind of a thing Th to me this shows theism theism is is an acknowledgement you're not one with ultimate reality or the beloved you're not one you're, you there's a relationship that can be strained it can be something can get in the way. Okay. It's so interesting here. She says about the moonlight is no comfort to me, and she might mean that just because she's using the analogy of a knight. Uh, but also, I'm thinking kind of like with the jackass, where you know, if she's so used to the sunlight and this like full on experience of Krishna, then having less, even if that is more than we would even have, you know, because she seems to just have so much more awareness. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. That feels like such a loss. So even if that's it's right. It's all relative to her. Yeah. 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 Her capacity for love. Wow. Good point. Very good point. Moonlight. In other words, I take it to mean that moonlight is sometimes in the past been very comforting to her. So this reminds her of the light at night. <laughs> but as she's saying, it isn't doing that for me right now. <laughs> You know, it's not working the way it has in the past. Wow. The way that Rabia, was it Rabia who would go onto her roof? Yes. At night, right? Like, so the moonlight that plays a big part in all of this mystical. And stars too. Mm -hmm. Little points of light. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, have... this just seems very human, you know, and you, you can't appreciate uh, the ecstasy, unless you know the opposite of the ecstasy. The agony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, oh, oh, this is yet another theme. This samsara is the is the ocean, the ups and downs of life. Right. That's a that's a major theme in Hindu Buddhist literature. So she's describing that sometimes she feels separate from her beloved. There's really more. I I, I you know. I, I could have gone longer on that, this theme. Mm -hmm. I just showed you a little taste of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we just have two more. Who hasn't read and would like to read? Jennifer, can you read? And then we'll pick on Susan again at the end. Okay. My beloved has returned with the rains and the fire of longing is doused. Now is the time for singing, the time of union. Mira's Lord is at home. Even the finest mist can fill the dry tanks and long searching has brought me my love. No fear remains, no absence, no drought. He has returned. He who comes to those who love has remembered his promise. I am dancing only for my master. All I want is to please him and keep his eyes. My dancing dress is faithfulness to him. Body and mind, Mira wears only the color of God. 
My Lord, the love that binds us cannot be broken. It is hard as diamond, shattering the hammer that strikes it. As a lotus lives in its pond, I am rooted in thee. Like the bird that gazes all night at the passing moon, I have blinded myself in giving my eyes to thy beauty. She who offers herself completely asks only this, that her Lord love my Mira as fully as he is loved. You know, I noticed the water metaphors up there. Even the finest mist can fill the dry tanks. So in other words, after the deprivation of separation, a little bit of water goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, this is the theme that comes after the the dark night of the soul. It comes after you. you in fact, maybe that's the purpose of it. So you, you go through that darkness so that you can appreciate the light. You might have been taking the light for granted too much. Um, anyway, interesting. I'm curious about the last part where she asks only that her, her Lord loved Mira as fully as, as he is loved. Um, what would be her sense of the relationship between herself and Krishna? Um, you know, she talks about her devotion to him, but there's no indication that I can see of um, what uh, Krishna feels about her. Oh, you know, you, yeah, you make me curious. I wonder if I could go into this book and find that theme. <laughs> In other words, the response of the beloved, right? Uh, I'm sure some of that's in there, but I don't know quite how to answer that. She usually feels loved by Krishna. Mm -hmm. She usually does. That's what she's telling us oh, uh, uh, from the get-go, from, from, from her mm -hmm. childhood on. Because she was in a family that was uh, bhakti oriented, love devotion oriented. Mm -hmm. And she mastered uh, the literature of ancient India. And um, just talking about it in a lot of different ways. You know, I, I didn't realize uh, the first time through this, you can, it's like an, she's educating you about the bounty of Indo, the Indian heritage. There's all these beautiful metaphors in there. And, so what, what, what would be the tradition of, um, you know, Krishna's attitude toward human beings? He loves them. You know, mm -hmm. let's go back to, um, okay, back to the, remember that what Krishna's words I gave you on page three, he says, I am the same to all beings. My love is ever the same, but those who worship me with devotion they are in me and mm -hmm. i am in them mm -hmm. i think jesus said something like this in the gospel of john <laughs> very similar um, yeah. so i think that's saying a bunch of things one is that uh the bhagavad gita describes all four yogas but i think it's giving pl pride of place to bhakti yoga it's sort of like saying that's a really a special type of yoga because it involves love, love of me. Yeah, and, and it, uh, yeah, it does yeah. say my love is ever the same. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, right, because I have to love everybody. So it's universal and abstract. But I like that. But but those who worship me with devotion, they are in me and I am in them. I'm close to them. Yeah. Wow. But it doesn't sound like a real personal love in the in the way that. Many Christian denominations today talk about the love that Jesus has for me, you know, or that, you know, God oh. has for me, you know, it's, it's, yeah, a broad, you know. it, it's a love for all of humanity. Mm -hmm. I think that some of that's been hyper personalized though. You know, that's just, it's, it, it's too, it, <laughs> you got to remember, uh, you know, an avatar or a savior it's supposed to be an intermediary be between humanity and God, not just you and God, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's a little bigger mm -hmm. than that. And it's not mm -hmm. all about you. <laughs> she, I don't think she loses that grip too much, Mirabai. Mm -hmm. she, she seems to have that broader picture. Um, okay. All right. <clears throat> 
Um, anything else for the good of the order? Oh, there's one more. Susan, can you read the last one? Surely. So this is delight with death as it brings final union with Krishna. The king sent a snake in a basket. They said, put this on your neck. Princess Mira fastened that jewelry smiling, calling it her nine stranded pearls. The king sent me poison, which I drank with delight, for since all people know that Mira is attached inseparably by love of God, nothing besides this love matters. If you've swallowed the divine name, no other liquor can touch you. To take this path is to walk the edge of the sword. Then the noose of birth and death is suddenly cut. Mira lives now beyond Mira. She swims deep mind and deep body in the Lord's ocean. This is very deep stuff. Very deep. Um, let me take a crack at some of this. The noose of birth and death. See, that's samsara. That's another way of talking about the, the fluctuation of ordinary life. The ups and downs, the pains and separations and the frustrations and occasional satisfactions and all that. Um, that's sort of like a rat race or a wheel you can't get off of. Okay. She's saying uh, her love is, a, is the noose of birth and death is suddenly cut. Wow. So in other words, that's what death would be. It would be cut. What's wrong with that? She's saying, no problem. They're trying <laughs> to poison me. I don't care if they poison me. They're trying to, you know, put a snake in the basket. So what? <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Any other observations here? Harold, I'm wondering what the nine stranded um, pearls refers to. Princess Mira fastened that jewelry, smiling, calling it her nine stranded pearls. Well, all I can, I, I'm just guessing. That must be uh, something very special, right? They, they're trying to, okay, let me look at this. The king sent a snake. A king in Rajasthan tried to kill her in a basket. They said, put this on your neck. Mira fastened that jewelry, smiling, calling it her nine strand. In other words, it wasn't an instrument of death. It was something I cherished. My favorite piece of jewelry. That's how she was treating it. And later on, uh, you know, that thing we read about, so they described her as treating poison like an elixir. Elixir is something that gives you what? Immortal life, eternal life, or the cure of all diseases or something. Um, so anyway, I'm just stretching because I don't know specifically about nine stranded pearls, but she, it's a contrast to what the king thinks he's doing with her. Okay, anything else on all this? I was just thinking this makes sense because uh, in Buddhism, nirvana uh, is when you get out of, well, arguably, it's when you get out of samsara. Uh, so then um, if you can merge fully with the divine, then that is like that, that makes sense as a kind of nirvana thing, getting out of this. Uh, so she's saying, yeah. um, if you take this path, that's the same as this walking the edge of the sword. So that's the same as the thing that's going to get you out of samsara. So that has the same parallel in Buddhism. Fantastic. I, yeah, that's the kind of thing I love for my comparative studies. That's beautiful. You know, there's a couple more goodies I want to mention. The 10th guru in Sikhism is this guru Gobind Singh. You may have heard of him. Okay. He wrote something in 1693 that included Mirabai's poetry as among the works of the 16 historic Bhakti saints who are most important to the Sikh faith. Wow. So this is one of the gurus saying, um, I'm, I'm, I'm saving you some time here. There are 16 wonderful Bhakti saints that are super important to us as Sikhs. One of them is Mirabai. <laughs> That's really beautiful. 
Yeah. So that's, see, he's, he's one of their most important gurus, probably the fourth, third or fourth most important of the 10. And he's saying this, wow. Here's another little tidbit. Akbar the Great is one of my favorite kings in history. Have you heard of him? He, he, he ruled India from 1560 to, do I mean that? 1560 to 1605, 45 years. Okay. And he was Muslim, but he believed in all religions have truth. So he, he was utterly amazing. He started interfaith devotions and discussions. Unbelievable, Akbar. Okay, there's a story that Akbar, let me just read this. The Mughal Emperor Akbar is said to have come in disguise to see this renowned devotee of God, Mirabai. Her appeal extending across religious boundaries. Here's a problem with this. Supposedly, she died in 1546. Akbar is not king yet. He was a little baby or something about that age. So I'll tell you what I think. They don't know when Mirabai died. It may have been 1562 instead of 46. Maybe this happened. Maybe this was in the early part of Akbar's reign. But in any case, what it tells you is she is so important and uh, an object of devotion that they want to even connect this great king to her. <laughs> they want to say somehow he wanted to see her. So he dresses up in disguise so he could sneak closer to her, right? Wow, interesting. Okay, we might be done, unless there's uh, more observations. You know, I had my third COVID shot yesterday and I was sick all day today. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm really amazed I got through this because I had this throbbing headache and I thought, what if I can't think and say anything important? They're in the class, but I somehow got through. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you for that. Thank you. Are you still feeling a bit rough tonight, Harold? A little bit rough, yeah. It, it, the other two shots didn't bother me, but this booster caught up to me somehow. I yeah. had the same reaction. <laughs> did you? Did you already? Oh, okay, that's good to know. Tell you, you know, I remember the nurse saying, you might get something like a flu. She said it about three times to me. I think they were warning me. Uh. <laughs> Harold, did you have the same the same vaccine each time? Yeah, Moderna. Yeah. Moderna. We were fine, both Ev and I. Oh, we had the Pfizer. We were both fine with all three. That's terrific. Yeah. You've had all three. Good. Yeah. Good. But, you know, friends, I, I want to tell you a sneak preview of something. You know, I, this course I've done before with, with six women. Then I added two more and got eight. Then I added two more and got 10. One of them is this Mira Alfasa who she hooked up with Aurobindo in India at a place called Pondicherry. And they started a town called Auroville. And I'm learning all, this is the new one to me. This is the one I hadn't done before. And so uh, anyway, that'll be our ninth session. But what's occurring to me, these women were, 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 fought, were getting closer to our own time. Yeah. So, okay, next time is uh, Teresa of Avila. And uh, you'll feel that's okay, getting a little more sophisticated, you know, naming what happens as you undergo spiritual ascent. And then Tahare is a Baha'i woman who is, it's funny, in, in Pakistan, they study a Tahare as, as, as a woman mystic, right? They, they don't worry about what, what her, you know, religious tradition is, but the theme of uh, she had dealt, she deals with a lot is the new world in the making. So in other words, Tahare and uh, Mira Alfasa and Barbara Marks Hubbard, the very last, are all very outer looking. Like they're starting to sort of look at the whole world. Auroville was supposed to be a little experiment where what if we had a, a beautiful spiritual community, but still met the basic needs of human life? Is that possible? Once we have a model for that, we can have cities like that all, all over the world. And another thing in common, all three of those women, the last three are dealing with evolution too, in, in, or it, it, meaning collective evolution, humanity, spiritual evolution. So they're, they're very futuristic, right? They're, they're more futuristic than the other ones that we've looked at. 
Okay. You know, Harold, I want to connect some more mystic dots. So please. We, so Mirabai, another Mirabai star. So she wrote, so I, I mentioned her recent one, Wild Mercy, about women mystics. But she's also famous here in the States for writing a translation of Teresa of Avila's Interior Castle. No kidding. And I just, I just pulled a book up on Amazon to get the title, and I discovered she's going to release a book next year with Richard Rohr on Julian of Norwich. Are you kidding me? No, go on. I, should, I want to talk to this it. lady. I have to email you her. You need to know her. Yeah. Find my, yeah. Get her email address. <laughs> she will talk to you too, Harold. Like she's, she's yeah. not so famous. She won't talk to the, because yeah. I know that she stayed with some good friends of mine who are part of the contemplative society. So contemplative, mm -hmm. so she, uh, she actually stayed with them for the weekend. And yeah, she's that's, super yeah. accessible. Yeah. Kathy, really accessible. Kathy, you have to get her to come to one of your, Living Interfaith Sanctuaries. That would be amazing. Uh, on, on you can actually, her writing is in this week's uh, Richard Rohr's Daily Meditations. And I was oh. just reading, I read those every day. And I think it was mm -hmm. the one yesterday about mm -hmm. her um, description of the divine feminine. So yeah. beautiful. She yeah. reminds yeah. me of Valerie Kaur uh, mm -hmm. from the Sikh tradition, who I think is like another modern day mystic, uh, mm -hmm. who everything she writes is so unbelievably beautiful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I, I'll see if we could... Yeah. Reach out and email Mirabai Star. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she, she has a she has a good website, and uh, yeah, and um, you can see you know daily things from her. Also, I read yeah. Richard Rohr's daily column also, but Mirabai say, comes up she, often. I'm curious, does she ever say anything about uh, Jewish mysticism? She might. I'll have to pull out my book. She, but you yeah, know what? She would. She might even love to join this group one evening just to chat. Mm -hmm. That'd be very fascinating. We would totally do something. We, have a, like we could have a special yeah. one just for her, just, 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 just with her and looking at all of, you know, She'd mystic love history, that. women's mystic history through the ages. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, this Alfasa is, she was into, into what's called uh, occult philosophy too. So that opens up a lot of stuff hermetic tradition, Kabbalism, which is Jewish mysticism. And all of that stuff has family resemblances. Some of what, remember when we did Hypatia, there was this thing called the circle of existence, which yeah. means, uh, you know, in a way the divine is coming down to us and in a way we're going back up. It's like, it's like a circle, right? So that mm -hmm. idea is very old. No one knows yeah. quite where it started, but occult philosophy brings that up a lot. Yeah. So and Mira, Mir I'm sorry. Yeah. Mirabai Starles, um, also um, does a lot of astrology. No kidding, which goes, oh, you know, I'm fascinating with this thing called hermetic tradition because that included astrology in the spiritual sense and as a science. So some of that became what we call modern sciences and some of it remained, you know, Carl Jung dug into a lot of this, right? The psychological, spiritual use of these things and the scientific use. They, in the I, beginning, they were not separated. They, they were all one type of not knowing, right? Way back. Okay, friends, thank just, you. I just put her website in the chat there for you so you can learn all about her. And oh, very good. And thank speaking you so invitations, much. there you are. <laughs> we'll try to befriend her. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> Carol, well, thank, thank you so much. Thanks, I, Carol. I, thank you. You hung in so well. This was fantastic. I knew nothing about her. This was just wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes. But she fits with other things you know, too. like the Sikh <laughs> faith, right? Yeah. She. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.